This morning, John 12 is the beginning of the time whenever we find the last week of Christ, uh, time here on earth. Uh, in the previous uh, chapters, we have found him uh, coming in on the triumphal entry, as many have called it. Jesus ascend, uh, uh, descended from the Mount of Olives into Jerusalem upon a donkey, and people came out and began to wave the palm branches and uh, and to cry out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they recognized that uh, this man that has been doing all these miracles was truly uh, the Messiah. Of course, in doing so, that stirred up the rage of many others uh, uh, in the land, especially the Pharisees and the Sadducees. As Jesus completes his time coming into the, uh, into the city there. Uh, he goes straight to the temple and once again for a second time he cleanses the temple. Uh, he takes a, a whip that he makes and begins to drive out the money changers and all of those who are making merchandise of the, uh, the temple itself. They, they had created a system in where uh, nobody could bring in a lamb good enough for sacrifice unless you bought it from the temple. And then in doing so, you had to come in with your own money and exchange it for temple money. And then you were allowed to buy something to provide a sacrifice uh, for yourselves. You can see the obvious uh, monopoly that was created uh, there by, the, uh, by the, uh, the Jews. And so they took advantage of this and it just, the Lord was very disturbed by it. In fact, he said this series said that they made his house a den of thieves and it was supposed to be a house of prayer very uh, piercing words and once again stirring uh, the, these men up, these Pharisees, these Sadducees to the point to where they were so enraged they wanted nothing more than to kill Jesus. Uh, they, uh, Jesus then and his disciples left and they went to a place called Bethany. Uh, Bethany was a place that was a, uh, was a resort almost for Jesus. 
Uh, he had friends there. Uh, Lazarus, uh, we see in the previous chapter that he had raised from the dead. Uh, he lived there. His, uh, his sisters Martha and Mary uh, lived there. And oftentimes Jesus would find himself in their house and be, and be taken care of. And so we find ourselves here in chapter 12 uh, that Jesus is visiting again uh, with Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. I want you to keep your finger at John 12 and find with me Mark chapter 14 as well. And I'm going to go back and forth between these two passages uh, quite a bit this morning. Now in verse number 3 of chapter 14 of Mark, the Bible says, And being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment, of spikenard, very precious, and she broke the box and poured it on his head. We find here a little more detail given to us that they are not located at the house of Lazarus and Martha and Mary, but instead they are at this man Simon the leper's house. And, and so we have this time of fellowship and, and everybody is gathered around. And uh, there are some things for us to pull away from this here this morning. I want us to just kind of think about a few things, but there's one thought in particular that we'll get to here in just a moment that I really want us to grab onto and just dwell on this morning and be challenged by. Uh, first thing I want you to see is once again we find Martha uh, here doing what Martha does. Uh, back in John 12 and verse 2 the Bible says, There they made him a supper and Martha served. Martha it was that kind of lady who always served. Uh, she served uh, most of the time with a joyful heart. Uh, usually, whenever we talk about Martha serving, we go back to that particular instance where Martha was overwhelmed with the serving of everybody. And she came in to Jesus and said, Jesus, tell my sister to come in and, uh, and to help me uh, serve everybody. Jesus told Martha, said, no, 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 Mary has chosen that, that better part. Uh, Mary sat at the foot of Jesus and wanted just to take in what was being said that day. And so uh, we often think, well, see, Jesus, he, he, he rebuked Martha. Well, in that one case he did, but that was Martha's gift. Martha's gift was a servant's heart. Uh, she just enjoyed serving here, and there's nothing wrong with that uh, of working for the Lord. There's a place for us to be busy working for the Lord. And that's what here we find with Martha. Uh, there's no uh, overwhelmingness here. There's no, uh, hey, where is everybody else supposed to be helping me? Instead, this time here, she is just enjoying her time of serving her Lord. Uh, that one that just in that previous chapter we mentioned already, but it was Jesus who came to the tomb that day and her brother Lazarus was dead and Jesus called out Lazarus come forth that is still fresh in her mind as no doubt as she is serving and maybe as she peers around the corner and she looks in and she sees her 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 brother sitting there alive talking with Jesus and just in fellowship with Jesus, no doubt there was, a, there was just a, an overwhelming thankfulness coming into her heart as she just looked upon that. At one time she complained about this, now she's overjoyed yeah. to be able to serve and to see that, uh, that taking place here. Uh, there's no complaining. Instead, we find a lady joyfully serving the one she believed in for her salvation. We see that in John chapter 11, that she believed that Jesus was truly the Messiah. Uh, she's enjoying serving the one that she loved. An opportunity just to serve Jesus. And she's, she's serving the one who had brought her, uh, her brother back to her. And boy, when we think about what God has done for us, and we start to dwell on the fact that he sent his son to die on the cross to provide salvation for us, uh, for him to ask of us anything, uh, there should be an overwhelming uh, desire in our heart to say, yes, Lord, I want to be used by you. Uh, just like uh, Isaiah, after Isaiah had those, that coal set upon his lips and and, and God cried out and said, uh, who will go for us? Uh, and whom shall I send? And Isaiah quickly responded, here am I, Lord, uh, send me. And God said, now listen, Isaiah, it's not going to be an easy test. They're going to hold their, they're going to close their ears up. They're not going to listen to you. They're going to reject the message. He said, he warned them what it was going to be like. But Isaiah said, oh, Lord, I see what you've done for me. I want to serve you, Lord, send me. I want to be a servant in your hand. That's where Martha was at. She wanted to serve her, Lord, out of gratitude of her, not out of duty. 
Too often we do things out of duty. Well, I, I guess I better. Uh, otherwise, God's going to strike me or He's going to uh, make me have some terrible disease or He's going to do this or that or whatever. No, no. There should be a gratitude in our heart that says, Oh, Lord, I want to serve you. Uh, Lord, what can I do for you? Uh, Lord, I don't care how small the task. I don't care how large the task. Lord, you just tell me what you want. That was Martha's heart. Yeah. I just want to serve. I just want to be a blessing uh, here. And sh surely there, there's that part of us here that we should be challenged by this morning. Lord, what would you have me to do? Lord, how can I be of use to you? Lord, how can I serve you? And by the way, when he takes you up on it, yeah. Yeah. don't get disgruntled. Yeah. Don't say, well, well, but that, that's not what I wanted to do. Yeah. Don't be like Peter. Well, Lord, what about him? And we always want to say, we all, yeah, Lord, here am I. I'll do what you want me to do. Wait, wait, what are you going to do with Brother Danny, though? I, I, I don't, like, don't give him a better job than me. And we're so concerned. You know, that, the, the heart here is, Lord, what can I do? Lord, what can I do? That, that desire to serve. Uh, but not only do I find Martha uh, there serving, but I also see there in verse number 2, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. <laughs> what an opportunity. What an opportunity to sit at the table and just listen to the lovely Savior. Yeah. Just to hear him speak. Lazarus just a few weeks ago was dead. He lay in a tomb. Four days he was dead. And then the cry came, Lazarus! Yeah. I like what one preacher said. He said he had to be very specific about who he was calling out because if he had just said, come forth, everybody would have been coming out of those graves that day. Yeah. He called out and said, Lazarus, come forth. I wonder if there was conversations that Lazarus and Jesus could have that nobody else could have. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, but there he is. He is sitting there and he's, he's hearing the words of Jesus. Can I, I tell you, it's, it's, it's great to serve the Lord. It's great to work for the Lord, but don't substitute your work for the Lord from sitting down and just having the words of the Lord come in as well. There's a time for service. But oh, there, there should be time where we just sit down and we have fellowship with Him. We just take the time to take in what He has. Uh, there's Lazarus who was dead now alive sitting there. And there's over here on around, the, around the table over here is Simon the leper. As good as dead. He was the walking dead, if you will. He, he was the original zombie. I mean, that, that's what he was. It was death. I mean, everybody knew you're going to die. And all of a sudden, Jesus one day comes to him and says, Simon, I'm going to heal you. I'm going to take away the leprosy. And here he is. Uh, he is cleansed. He's whole every whit because Christ always did things complete. And can you see these men as they sit around and Lazarus is telling Simon, oh yeah, I was dead for four days. Oh, well, uh, that's pretty impressive. I mean, I was falling apart for, uh, for years and uh, look what God did for me. And they're back and forth and Jesus is there uh, talking with them and sharing with them, instructing them. Boy, take time to take in some, uh, some of the words of the Lord as well throughout the time, uh, through your day. There needs to be that time of personal daily walk with the Lord where you enjoy your fellowship with Him. A time of sweet communion uh, where you just join up with Him. Everything else gets shut out. Yeah. It's just you and the Lord. I, I can almost see the, the busyness of the house. The Bible tells us later on there were many coming and going because of Lazarus. I can see Him as people are peering into the window and looking in and say, that's Him. Yeah. I was there. I saw him. He was dead. He stunk. <laughs> but look at him. He's talking. The Bible says there were busy people all around. People that were just that could try to get the attention, but they had one focus. Jesus. I get to be with my Jesus for a little while here. And boy, they want to have that time with there. Can I just encourage you to make sure you have regular attendance of hearing the Word of God? Yeah. To have regular attendance uh, where you take the time, uh, be in church where you can hear the Word of God preach, uh, be in Sunday school so you can hear the Word of God taught. Oh, my, my friend, every time the Word of God gets open, every time there's an opportunity to receive the Word of God, show up, be there, because you might catch something that you never knew before. You might miss out on something if you don't show up. You don't believe me? Ask Thomas. Yeah. 
Right. Thomas didn't come to church. He was out doing something else and Jesus showed up and they're all telling Thomas, oh, Jesus came, Jesus came. I won't believe it. Why? Because he wasn't there. You don't know what the Lord wants to do. You don't know what he's going to do in your midst. And so you better make sure you show up. That's right. be, around, be around the word of God. Take the time to, uh, to think on it. What's the purpose? Why? Why should we assemble ourselves together? One, God tells us to. Right. Yeah. Hebrews 10, 25, not to forsake the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but so much the more as you see the day approaching. My, do we see the day approaching? Yes. Yeah. Is it obvious to you to, to look out in this old world and watch how things continue to digress and digress and digress? The Bible says as you watch things digress, get together more. Uh, spend more time together. Uh, get around that Word of God. Why? Because whenever you begin to look around this world and you see where everything's going, you're going to get discouraged. Uh, you're going to get down. You're going to think, oh my, oh my, what's going to happen next? But you get around the Word of God. It gets your vision and gets your focus upward. You say, oh, it's all okay. Everything's falling apart around me. But he's got it all under control. And he's, got it. he's going to be back soon enough to put everything back together the way they need to be. Ever, even so, come, Lord Jesus, should be the heart cry of every one of us. Get in church, it'll encourage you. You get down, you get discouraged, come to church. You, are, are you encouraged? Well, come to church to encourage somebody else then. Man, just, just be with the believers. But also this here in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, God tells us here that the purpose of coming together is to continue in the apostles' doctrine. To be in the Word of God, to learn it, to, to find out what it's all about, to find out what the teaching is, uh, to continue in those things there, uh, to continue in fellowship. Who's your best friends? Who's your best friends? I'm sometimes amazed that Christians will, will take and they will have best friends and, and those best friends are not believers. And what a best friend is supposed to do is supposed to help encourage you, help build you up. But if they're not even saved, how can they build you up towards the Lord? Yeah. But the, the people that, uh, that are in our church, they should be uh, some of our dearest and closest friends. Now, you don't have to be best friends with everybody in here. But boy, there should be some that you're just, you, you come along and they, you see them along the way and they just encourage your heart. They help you. And boy, you, you look forward to that fellowship time. And when you walk out of these doors... You should be feeling refreshed. Right if you walk out of these doors and you're feeling even worse, you got the wrong kind of friends. Because, yeah. boy, that fellowship should be helping you. But also in breaking of bread, uh, to be reminded of his death, his burial and resurrection, to be reminded of what he has done for us, uh, to, to have that time of fellowship. What an awesome thing there. Lazarus here is a picture to us of just stopping everything else in our life and just take some time with the Lord. But our focus this morning is not on Martha or Lazarus this morning. I want our focus to be on this lady Mary today. Mary came not just to work and to serve. Mary did not come just to hear the words of Christ. But instead that day as she came to her Lord, she came with one thing in mind, and that was to worship. That was to worship. Oh, how she loved her Savior. There was nobody more important in her life, I believe, than her Savior. Working for the Lord and enjoying His Word are essential, but let's not forget who He is. He's God. Amen. And He deserves our worship. In John 4, we're reminded there, as Jesus talked with the woman at the well, that we are to worship Him in spirit and in truth, God has some things He requires of us as we come in uh, to worship. And He wants things done right. He wants things done well. He wants things done so that He gets the glory. Because He deserves the glory. If, if what we do is to put the focus on ourselves, then we're worshiping ourselves. We're not worshiping Him. If everything is about, well, what, this makes me feel good. and this, this Wrong, 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 wrong. It's not about Him then. Boy, it's got to be about, when it comes to worship, it's got to be all about Him. Mary came into that room in the midst of that group, and she worshiped her Lord. Let's look and see what she did that day. The Bible says that Mary took a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, John notes. 
very costly. And anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. We see in Mark chapter 14 that she does the same here. But we see that, that alabaster box of ointment of spike and are very precious. She break the box and, and poured it on his head. And, and as it's poured on his head and it begins to go down, it, it comes down upon his feet there. And it's, it, it just that, that, that odor there, it just fills the room. And, it, and she, she sees uh, this here, this, this thing that she has given to her Lord. And she then gets down on her knees as she comes before her Lord and she takes her hair and she begins to, to wipe his feet with her hair. What a picture. What a picture that she has provided for us here this morning and uh, that as we see this lady come in she takes this thing called spike and it was a liquid perfume that was as John said very costly and extremely expensive thing. The, 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 the term used here tells that it was pure or genuine the very best that money could buy. The very best. She poured it out in a lavish gesture. It was very generous, it was spontaneous. She wiped his feet with her hair. Her position as we find her there, to get to his feet, she had to get down on her knees. And with that long hair that she had, it was, you know, they weren't like us today. She just couldn't run to the uh, hairstylist or whatever and get the right kind of shampoo or conditioner to help take care of her hair. Uh, for them to manage this long hair, you ladies know, it's, it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot, of, a lot of doing here. And so for her to take that hair that's been taking care of it and managing for her to come and to begin to use that to wipe the feet of Jesus. What a picture. What, what a picture she is giving to us here. Uh, I want us to think about some things here about our worship this morning. Uh, what are some things that we can learn from Mary about our worship? Can I tell you, first off, genuine worship is not concerned with the cost. If you were to go back to the book of Malachi, you would find in the book of Malachi that God tells his priests that he had something against them. And what he had against them was this here is that they were bringing to him the leftovers of their flocks. The, they were bringing the blind, they were bringing the lame, they were bringing the spotted. And, and God was very clear in His Word back in the Old Testament there in the law that He expected it to be a, a, a lamb without spot, uh, without blemish. Uh, it, it had to be the, the firstborn, it had to be the best of the best is what He was asking for. Why? Because it was a picture of His Son, Jesus Christ, and He was going to give His best uh, for us. And so in turn, as He asked Him for the sacrifice, it was a, it was a four shadowing of what Christ would be for them. But the, the priest had, had got to a point where they said, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. All we're doing is going to cut its throat. All we're going to do is pour out its blood. And all we're going to do is put it on the altar for sacrifice. So it doesn't matter. And what they had done is they had brought the cost of worship down to where it meant any, nothing to anybody. They looked at those little lambs that they had and they thought, well, they're not going to bring anything in that market. Oh, they're not going to be much uh, worth to me. And in fact, I'm probably going to have to put it down. Oh, wait a minute. Instead of putting it down, hey, let's take it down to the temple and we'll give it as an offering to the Lord. Yeah. And sometimes it's what our worship is. Yeah. Sometimes our worship is just the leftovers of what we have and we expect the Lord to be happy to get it. We stay up late. Yeah. We come rushing in. We sit down and then we say, Lord, you know, preacher, try to bless me if you can. We, we, have, we have no, we're, we're not intent on giving God the best. That's what he asks for though. He wants the best from us here. And as Mary comes to him that day, she doesn't go in through her, her closet or through her drawers and, and find some, oh, there's some perfume I got from the dollar store. That'll work. Instead, she got something that the, the Bible says that Judas Iscariot, of all people, did a quick estimation of the cost. And he said, that could have been sold for 300 penny worth. So, well, what's the big deal about that? Well, if you know, understand what the Bible is talking about here, a penny was a day's wages. So, 300 days wages. 
A year's worth of work is what it took to buy this one box of ointment. I don't know what uh, your bank account looks like, but uh, it, mine doesn't hold a year's worth of salary in it. Uh, you know, I don't have anything that's a value of, of one year's salary where I could just say, you know what, forget the bills, forget everything else, I'm just going to go buy this one box of ointment. It was something that was very costly, something that had a great value to it. Uh, it may have been something that was given to her. It may have been something that was, uh, that was she had worked for all her, <clears throat> all her life and had saved so she could have this one box of wine. Maybe it was something that she was looking forward to using for some special occasion. Maybe, maybe her wedding. It was something of great value. And then she saw her Savior. She saw the man who was responsible for bringing her brother back to life. She saw the man who was going to go to a cross for her in just a few days. She looked at him and something in her heart said, he deserves the best. And so I'm going to give him the best. And so she goes to her, her room and I can see her as she pulls that box out. And she thinks about the cost of this. And as she thinks about what she's about to do, she looks at Jesus and says, He's worth every penny. She brings that into a, listen, genuine worship is going to cost you something. If you think you can just waltz in and waltz right back out and God will be happy, that's not worship. Worship isn't singing a couple of songs Worship isn't sitting and listening to a sermon. Worship isn't just kind of kick back, relax, and be entertained. That's not worship. That's what our world calls worship today. Yeah. But that's not what worship is. Worship, worship is not about the strobe lights. Worship's not about the fog machine. Worship's not about the, the drum set. Uh, worship's not about the, the swaying and the kumbaya and everything. No, 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 no. Worship is much more than that. Amen. Worship is much more than a feeling. You understand all those things that I just described? That's what the modern day worship looks like. You know what all that appeals to? Yeah. It has nothing to do with Him. It has nothing to do with truth. It has nothing to do with spirit. And we got to understand that God so desires our worship, but when we're going to worship Him, it must be in spirit and in truth. And He invites us to come in, but it's going to cost you something. What did it cost you today to come? What did it cost you today to come and prepare yourself to worship Him? You understand, that's what worship is supposed to be about. Genuine worship is not concerned by the stares and the sneers of carnal minds. Old Judas, John points out to us there in verse 6, he says, he wasn't concerned about the poor. He was the one who kept the money bag. And the Bible tells us that he was a lifter of the bag. You say, what does that mean? That means he was taking a little bit out for himself. That's, what he, that's all he was concerned about. But there they are. They're over there looking saying, well, we could have sold that and given it to the poor and I could have got a cut off of that thing. Oh, well, we could have done this and, and oh, we could have done that. And, oh, what a waste. What a waste. Oh, you're a bunch of, you're, you're foolish to do those things. You're foolish to follow after uh, the things of God. Oh, you're foolish to give your life for Him. Oh, you're foolish to do those things. But you know what he says? It doesn't matter what everybody else tells you. It doesn't matter what everybody else is saying. Where's your worship at? If you're doing your worship to get the approval of man, then you know what? You have your reward. You understand, sometimes real worship is going to twist the nose of others around you. Real worship is sometimes going to make people uncomfortable. You know why? Because it's not of the flesh. And the flesh gets real uncomfortable when it gets around spiritual things. Why? Because it's out of its element. It's out of its sphere. It can't control those things. And so we have to understand that when we're going to worship the Lord. Hey, just ignore, just ignore those carnal minds. Just ignore those who are going to cast those asper, uh, those, those, uh, those, 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 those wicked words at you, those that are trying to tear you down. Hey, just be concerned about one thing. I just want to, I just want to worship the Lord. That's what she came over and done. Uh, general, I'm sorry, genuine worship requires humility. 
I like what one man said, humility is not thinking less of ourselves, humility is not thinking of ourselves at all. Just, there's no consideration. I don't think about me at all. It's not thinking less, but it's just not thinking about myself at all. Why? Because my thoughts, my focus is totally on Him. Can you see her as He walked in? All these fellas, the disciples, Lazarus, Jesus, Simon, maybe some other men around the table here, and they're all sitting around there waiting for dinner. Waiting for Martha to come in with, with you know, the, uh, with, with the roast and, uh, you know, and having uh, carrots and whatever else she's got it there. And she's got everything cooked up and where well, they can smell that coming in. And then all of a sudden here comes this little lady here and she comes right over where Jesus is and she cracks that box open and she pours it over his head. And as it goes down and, and, and drips down onto his feet and she gets down on her hands and her knees with her hair and she begins to take that hair and she leans down and begins to wipe his feet position of great humility. We keep ourselves from worshiping the Lord because we're concerned about maintaining our look. We're concerned about maintaining a certain decorum, if you will. We're, we're concerned about maintaining uh, a, a good name. And we like to pull on a whole lot of things to help make us feel better. And the whole time the Lord's saying, I wish you would just worship me. I just want you to worship me and not be worried about what everybody else is thinking. Genuine worship has thoughts only of Christ. That's all we're thinking about. What were you thinking when you were doing that? Jesus. Well, what were you thinking when you busted in and broke up the dinner? Just Jesus. Well, what were you thinking when you cracked that box open, Mary? Jesus. I just want him to have the best. I just want him to have the, the greatest thing I could give to him. Can I tell you, genuine worship leaves behind a fragrance that is unmistakable and unavoidable. All of a sudden, <laughs> that smell of dinner was gone. And now that overpowering fragrance of that spike nerd just filled the room. Everybody could smell it. Everybody was going to walk out with a little bit of, a little bit of that on them too. Yeah. It's unavoidable. Well, you know, listen, you know when you've met with the Lord. And usually everybody else does too. The Bible talks about Moses going to see the Lord and he visited with the Lord, and the Lord would come down in that, that tent uh, there at the tabernacle and visit with him. And, and there was this face-to-face -face meeting they would have. On one occasion, he was up in the cleft of the rock, and as God passed by, Moses got a glimpse of just the backside of the Lord. The Bible says that he came down from visiting and being with the Lord, that when he came to the people, his face shone so much that they just couldn't look on him. And they said, put a veil on your face, Moses, so we can look at you was so evident that he had been in the presence of the Lord. When he would go into that tabernacle to visit with the Lord, the Bible says he would take that veil off. But then when he had to go back out to the people, he had to put that veil on. By the way, it never says it ever quit. Well, it's, it's an amazing thing. It's, it's unavoidable. It is, it is unmistakable. When we have been in the presence of the Lord, it will affect you. It will affect everybody else around you as well. Everybody else around you will know that you have been with the Lord. I want you to go back with me, if you would, to Mark chapter 14. The Bible tells there were some, verse 4, that had indignation within themselves and said, Why was this waste of the ointment made? For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and had been given to the poor, and they murmured against her. And Jesus said, Let her alone. Why trouble you her? She hath wrought a good work on me. For you have the poor with you always, and whensoever you will, you may do them good, but me you have not always. She hath done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body to the burying. You understand that in just a few days, Christ would be crucified. And at the end of that crucifixion, they would have a very small window of time to get his body down. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus would would pull that body off of the cross. 
I could see as they would get that ladder out to get up to where they could remove the hands uh, from, the, from the cross beam and have to pull it through with a, with a spike being driven in. There was no hammer claw to pull that out, so they would have to pull that, that through. And as they, as they did, I could see as one man was up on the ladder and the other one down below, and, and he, would, he would catch the body and be draped over his shoulder, and they would come down and they would have to do the same thing of the feet pull a foot off and then pull the second foot off and then they wrapped that body up in linen cloth and they had no time to do the proper burial. They had no time to do the proper uh, anointments and everything else. And so what Jesus is saying here is that Mary, what she has done is actually doing what would need to be done for his body, but it's getting done a few days ahead of time. Yeah. That's, that's what he's talking about there. Yeah, that's why the ladies later on, we find them coming to the tomb that Sunday morning. And they were wondering how they were going to get the stone out of the way because they needed to go in and prepare the body properly. So that, that was their intent. So this was what was being done. But I want you to catch one phrase in here this morning. And that is this. She hath done what she could. What is it? that you could do for your Lord. We are so quick to remind ourselves of what we cannot do that we forget what we can do. Maybe you cannot sing. Maybe you cannot teach a Sunday school class. Maybe you cannot help out in a bus route. Maybe there's some things that you're limited to do. But what can you do? What can you do? This lady here, Mary, she would never be a preacher. Couldn't be. Uh, she would never be uh, maybe some uh, great well-known person, but you know what she could do? She could give to God her very best. Yes. You know what she could do? She could worship her Lord. You know what she could do? She could ignore everybody else and take him at his word and believe who he is and just fall down and worship before him. That's what she could do. Several years ago now, we had an evangelist in our church in Connecticut. And one day he asked me, he said, um, he said do you know where such and such cemetery is? And I said, well, I don't know, but we can find it pretty quick. And so I looked up some things there and Found, figured out where it was at. And so that one afternoon, I took the evangelist. We went to go grab a bite to eat for lunch. And then we headed down to Bridgeport, Connecticut. We got down in Bridgeport and we drove into this cemetery. Just, I mean, there were, there were markers everywhere. And so I thought, boy, this is going to be fun trying to figure this out. And so we got in there. We drove around a little bit and we got to about the area we thought it was. And I remember on one, as we, we got to a place, I remember looking over this way here and there was this giant, I don't know what you would call it, but it just, I mean, just this huge monument that just stood, it seemed like it stood about 15 feet tall. It was to P.T. Barnum, the great circus man. And there, there it was, this giant thing over here of P.T. Barnum, and it had all these wonderful things written about him and all this other stuff here. And then I looked down this way here a, a good ways, and, and I could see another tall structure. And on top of it, it had a man about... I don't know, about this tall, I guess, a statue of a man. And it was supposed to be the, a full-size statue of Tom Thumb. Some of you remember who that man is there. You've read about him, whatnot, small man, part of this here. And there's a great big statue of him. And so we knew this, okay, well, that's where that is, and that's where this is. And so by doing this here, it was, there was a triangulation. We knew about this. And it said this about right here is where we should be at. And so we begin to search and begin to go through. And as we went along, we found the one we were looking for. Yeah. It was the marker for Fanny Crosby. A lot of us know the story of Fanny Crosby, that as a young little girl she had an eye uh, a disease of some sort and a doctor came in thinking that he had a treatment that would take, would draw out the, the issue, but instead it, it, it caused her to be blind. For all of her life she would be blind and she would not know many of the wonderful sights that we get to see. But Fanny Crosby did not just sit back and just say, woe is me and look at all the terrible things that have been dealt to me. Instead she picked up her pen. And she began to write. 
She would go and she would help out in the, uh, in the prisons uh, with the prison ministries there. And she would go in and, and help to, to try to be a blessing to those folks who were found themselves in, uh, in there as they would uh, preach the gospel to them. Uh, uh, she was one of the singers who would sing. And then she would go, especially to the ladies, and try to uh, be a witness to them. And uh, She was there for the camp meetings and, and, and on those things there. And she would write special music for them. Uh, just a wonderful lady who just gave her heart and gave her, her life to the Lord. I, as I was, we lived up there. I remember I got to go over into New York, just over the border of Connecticut, and got to go to her house and see the house where she grew up at. It was a neat little place, a little placard out front to, uh, just to say this was where Fanny Crosby grew up at. Just an amazing thing. But, but as I was looking at this, at this marker of her, there was this big marker you could tell was kind of was fairly new. It stood about this tall, and it had some things written on there about Fanny Crosby. A few different details and whatnot. But then behind it was a marker that stood about this tall. That was the original marker. About this wide, just about this tall, not much on there. Didn't even have her name on it. All that was inscribed on that marker was this. She hath done what she could. That was her testimony. Blind. In that world, in that day and age, they thought she was of no use. But how many millions of people have been blessed, have been encouraged, have been led to the Lord because of the things that she has done for our Lord? She never sought remuneration for all of the work that she did. She never sought to be well known. She only wanted one thing, and that was to please her Lord. She just wanted to worship Him, and the one, one of the ways that God gifted her was for her to put down in pen, take pen to paper, and begin to write beautiful, wonderful words, I shall know Him. I shall know him when I look upon his face. They said, asked her one time, are you, are you sad, Fanny, that you can't see the sunsets? Are you sad that you can't see the beautiful creation that God has made? She goes, oh, no. I'm not sad at all. So wh how, how can that be? I mean, that doctor was so cruel in what he did to you and what he, he's ruined your life. He goes, oh, not at all. She says, because you understand the first thing that I'll ever see <coughs> will be the face of my Savior. Yeah. <coughs> That's a heart that has one thing in mind. There's a time for work. There is. We have to, there's a time that we're to be work, be busy for the Lord. There's a time for us to sit down and to just take in the Word of God and to dwell on these things here. But oh, let's worship Him. Let's do what we can for Him. Let's come before His presence and let's just, in our, with all that we have, just lift our hands in praise, lift our hearts in praise, and say, Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for all you've done for me. Lord, I just want to praise you. I just want to thank you for who you are. Worship. What are you doing today for the Lord? Are you doing what you can? Are you doing what you can? Can I just tell you this here? As you serve the Lord and as you try to worship Him, try to be pleasing to Him, there will always be those who will whine and complain. Some of us know the name Bill Borden. Bill Borden gave his life to the Lord, and he was to inherit a huge fortune. But instead of taking that fortune, he signed it away with the intent of going to the mission field. That was his plan. People here in the States told him he was a fool. He was a fool for turning his back on such fortune and going to live as a missionary. What a fool they told him he was. He didn't make it to the mission field. In fact, I believe he got to Egypt where he died on his way to the mission field. And even more folks said, oh, what a waste. What a waste. But it was not a waste. Because of Borden's willingness to lay down his life for the Lord, for the cause of Christ, it is said that thousands of young people signed up to go to the mission field because of the testimony of Bill Borden. Yeah. 
He gave up what this world looked as wealth, and they said, what a waste. Look what he's done with his life. He's wasted it. But it was not a waste. Why? Because it was all for him. And he laid his life down for the cause of Christ. Can I just encourage you today? There will be those who will whine and complain about you when you live for the Lord. Ignore him. Mary was not the least bit bothered, it seems like, by Judas Iscariot that day. Instead, she just continued to wipe his feet. Instead, she just continued to worship her Lord there. Oh, this morning, what can you do? What can you do? You could work for the Lord for sure. You could spend time with Him in His Word, and you can worship the Lord. Let's do what we can. Father.